सब्सक्राइब टू आर चैनल एंड प्रेस द बेल आइकन टू नेवर मिस एनी अपडेट फ्रॉम राउज आई एस स्टडी सर्कल ज्वाइन द ओनली ऑफिशियल टेलीग्राम चैनल ऑफ राउज आई एस स्टडी सर्कल टू गेट द रेलिवेंट मटीरियल्स एंड इम्पॉर्टेंट अपडेट्स हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द डेली न्यूज सिंप्लीफाइड द वर्ड वाई एंड हाउ ऑफ द न्यूज पेपर एनालिसिस फ्रॉम द सिविल सर्विस एग्जामिनेशन परस्पेक्टिव टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द हिंदू डेली एडिशन डेटेड सेवनटीन ऑगस्ट ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू This session will be co-presented by me and Baswa sir. The topics which are to be discussed have been displayed on your screen, and the time stamping of the same has been provided in the description box below. So first of all, there is an important announcement for all of you. The mains compass 2022 for all these subjects have been released. The mains compass is the yearly compilation which helps you with the concise and the quality material which is relevant for the upcoming mains examination. So all the interested students, especially those. who are writing this year mains are requested to go to the amazon and buy these compass magazines the link for this is provided in the description box below just click on that link and buy this quality material to get its access the first article for today's analysis appears on page number 10 the article is titled as understanding the ethanol blending this article shall be important from the perspective of gs paper 3 environment and biodiversity This article basically discusses various aspects related to the ethanol blending in India. Hence, as far as your UPSC prelims examination is concerned, one should be aware about the different types of bioethanol that is the first generation and second generation bioethanols. One should also be aware about the ethanol blending program and other initiatives such as PM Jeevan which the government has undertaken for the promotion of the bioethanol in india and as far as the mains examination is concerned from the perspective of the mains examination one should be aware about the benefits challenges and strategies to promote ethanol blending program now this particular topic is quite important for the upcoming mains examination because recently the niti aayog has published a report titled as india's road map for the ethanol blending program hence based upon our discussion a mains question for the practice here could be achieving energy security and the transitioning to low carbon economy is critical for india in the light of this statement discuss the potential and the challenges associated with the ethanol blending program apart from this particular mains question for practice you should also be in a position to attempt these three prelims question for practice so let us start our discussion of ethanol blending program with the very basics of what do you actually mean by bioethanol now bioethanol is basically a biofuel which is in turn derived from both food as well as non food sources so depending upon which particular source is being used for the production of bioethanol the bioethanol can be broadly categorized into first generation bioethanol and second generation bioethanol the first generation bioethanol is the bioethanol which is produced from the food sources whereas the second generation bioethanol is produced from the non food crops so when you look at the first generation bioethanol this can be produced from the materials which are either rich in starch or rich in sucrose so some of the starchy materials such as maize wheat barley cassava rotten potatoes etc can be used for the production of bioethanol similarly the sucrose containing materials such as sugar cane sugar beet sweet sorghum etc can also be used for production of first generation bioethanol now one basic problem with respect to first generation bioethanol is that it can lead to diversion of food for the non food purposes that is food which should actually be consumed by the humans it may be diverted for the production of bioethanol so this can adversely affect our food security this can lead to increase in inflation in food items such as maize wheat etc hence in order to solve this problem what we also have is a second generational bioethanol the second generation bioethanol is not produced from the food crops rather it is produced from the non food crops so non food crops such as 
the agricultural waste the bagas which is a by product of sugarcane industries municipal waste etc can be used for the production of the second generation bioethanol now with respect to various initiatives taken by the government for the promotion of ethanol blending first and foremost the government of india has launched the national policy on biofuels 2018 under this particular policy the government is trying to promote various biofuels including the ethanol so for the promotion of ethanol we have launched the ethanol blending program as part of national policy on biofuels so what we are doing as part of ethanol blending program here is we are mixing or blending ethanol along with the petrol when it is being sold to the consumers as a fuel for vehicles so one of the biggest advantage here is even if you mix ethanol along with the petrol to a certain percent or to a certain extent there is no drastic decrease in the fuel efficiency of the vehicles apart from that by blending or mixing ethanol we can actually reduce the consumption of petrol further ethanol being more environment friendly fuel this can help us to reduce the air pollution it can help us to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions so there are multifaceted benefits associated with the ethanol blending program accordingly we have targeted to have 10% ethanol blending by 2022 which means let's say if you are buying 10 liters of petrol out of this 10 liters at least 10% that is 1 liter should actually be ethanol apart from that we also had a target to have 20% ethanol blending by the end of 2030 so earlier target was to have e20 that is 20% ethanol blending by the end of 2030 but recently the government has decided to prepone this particular deadline by 5 years so instead of targeting e20 by 2030 we are targeting e20 5 years much earlier that is by the end of 2025 so this is a big announcement as far as the government is concerned the second one is with respect to interest rate subvention scheme for the ethanol production capacity see ethanol in case of india is basically produced by a numerous industries which are referred to as distilleries so in order to promote the production of ethanol the government of india is implementing a scheme known as interest rate subvention how does this particular scheme works now let's say there is a particular distillery which is availing loan from state bank of india for manufacturing or say expanding the production capacity of ethanol and let's say here the rate of interest at which it is borrowing loans from sbi is say 9% so government here may be paying say around 2 to 3% interest subsidy on the loans taken by this particular distillery so here this industry as such may be paying just around 5 to 6% of the interest rate and remaining 2 to 3% interest would be paid by the government on behalf of the distillery so this is the interest subvention scheme the next important initiative is the pradhan mantri jeevan which stands for jaiv indhan vatavaran anukul fazal avashesh nivaran yojana so this particular scheme basically seeks to support the production of second generation bioethanol from various non food crops please let me know in the comment section as to which particular ministry is implementing this particular scheme that is the pm jeevan scheme nextly if you look at the production of bioethanol it is not same across india in some of the states the production of bioethanol will may be more than what is actually required and in some states the production of bioethanol may be much lower than what is actually required so what we have to do here is we have to provide for a framework wherein the excess production of bioethanol from one particular state should be allowed to be transported to another state where the bioethanol production is quite lower for example let's say the production of bioethanol in maharashtra is more than what is actually required and let's say in the case of madhya pradesh the production of bioethanol is lower than what is actually required so we need to provide for a mechanism to transfer 
the bioethanol from the state of maharashtra to the state of madhya pradesh without any kind of disruptions for that the central government has amended the industries development and regulation act 1951 for the smooth interstate movement of bioethanol so these are the various initiatives so if you look at the present status as far as ethanol blending program is concerned the nodal department for the production of bioethanol as a fuel is the department of food and public distribution so this is a nodal department so please do understand here that it is not the ministry of new and renewable energy which is the nodal department for production of bioethanol rather it is the department of food and public distribution which is the nodal department for the production of bioethanol as a fuel all right now bioethanol in case of india is produced from various raw materials which include the sugarcane based raw materials such as molasses sugarcane juice sugar sugar syrup it can also be produced from surplus rice which is available with the food corporation of india as well as maize now with respect to pricing of ethanol once it is produced what we right now have is the administered pricing mechanism so under this administered pricing mechanism we have two types of ethanols that is first category is the ethanol which is produced from sugarcane sources such as molasses sugarcane juice sugar sugar syrup and so on and second category of ethanol is the ethanol which is produced from food grains such as rice wheat maize and so on so once the ethanol is produced from sugarcane sources that is by the sugarcane industries here the pricing of this particular ethanol is decided by the cabinet committee on economic affairs so just like how the cabinet committee on economic affairs declares the fair and remunerative prices for the sugarcane the cabinet committee on economic affairs also declares the price at which the ethanol should be bought by the oil marketing companies from the sugarcane industries with respect to second type of ethanol that is the ethanol produced from food grains here the cabinet committee on economic affairs is not coming into picture rather here the price is market determined and it is determined directly by the oil marketing companies the total annual production of ethanol that is the ethanol which has been supplied under the ethanol blending program in the last financial year this was 330 crore liters and we have already reached the target of 10% ethanol blending by the end of 2022 so even before the schedule that is even before the end of 2022 we have been able to reach the target of 10% ethanol blending now coming to the benefits or the potential of ethanol blending program so this ethanol blending program would have multifaceted benefits in terms of economic benefits environmental benefits it can help us to double the farmers income boost the manufacturing sector create jobs and so on so let us look into these benefits one by one starting with its ability to save the precious forex reserves see right now india imports more than around 85% of its crude oil requirements and we know that the prices of crude oil at the international level keep on fluctuating so whenever there is large scale increase in the prices of crude oil this not only leads to increase in our trade deficit it will also lead to increase in our current account deficit as well so entire our external sector as such gets adversely affected because of the international increase in crude oil prices so by promoting ethanol blending program we can actually reduce the consumption of crude oil for example according to niti aayog in the year 2020 2021 the total import of petroleum into india was around 185 million tons accounting for 55 billion dollars and niti aayog has estimated that the e20 program can actually save the country almost around 4 billion dollars per annum which roughly translates into rupees 30000 crores on an annual basis secondly see as i discussed before the ethanol is considered to be more environment friendly 
because the carbon as such gets completely burnt. So the promotion of ethanol blending will help us to reduce the carbon emissions and promote better air quality. Similarly, when we try to promote the second generation biofuels, particularly through the utilization of agricultural waste, municipal waste, etc., we can actually reduce the air pollution as well as the stubble burning, leading to improvement in the air quality. Nextly, see, like I said, one of the biggest problems for the Atmanibha Bharat is the energy insecurity that we keep on facing every year. So, India is heavily dependent upon the import of crude oil from the other countries. So, by promoting ethanol blending program, we can actually reduce the consumption of crude oil. This will make the Indian economy more resilient to the global external shocks that we are right now facing. Apart from that, Prime Minister Modi has set a target of becoming an energy independent country by the end of 2047 when India would be celebrating its 100 years of independence. So, ethanol blending program can actually help India to become an energy independent country. Nextly, by utilizing various agricultural waste as well as food crops, the ethanol blending program effectively creates backward linkages with the agriculture and by creating that kind of backward linkages, we can actually help the farmers to double their income levels. Ethanol blending program can also give a boost to the manufacturing sector and create more employment opportunities. Now, when you are discussing all of these benefits, ideally in mains examination, you should substantiate it through a case study. So here, you can take the example of the most successful country when it comes to promotion of ethanol blending and that country happens to be Brazil. Now, in case of Brazil, just like how we are targeting E20, Brazil as such has targeted ethanol blending in the range of 18% to 27.5. And already Brazil has been able to blend ethanol to up to 27%. So this is a huge success in case of Brazil, which should actually be replicated even in India as well. So having discussed the benefits of ethanol blending program, let us look into certain concerns and challenges and how to address these concerns. Precisely here, you should know the Niti Aayog's recommendations with respect to ethanol blending program for its success. So let's start with the concerns and challenges, starting with the challenges to the economy. See, as you can see here, I have delineated the concerns and challenges from the perspective of different stakeholders, like concerns and challenges with respect to economy, concerns and challenges faced by the producers of bioethanol, concerns and challenges faced by the oil marketing companies and concerns and challenges faced by the consumers. So even in your mains examination also, you should be able to incorporate such kind of points wherein you should be able to show that there are multiple stakeholders involved in the ethanol blending program and each of these stakeholders are facing challenges at different levels. So let's start with the challenges to the economy. First and foremost, according to some of the experts, in order to increase the production of ethanol, a huge amount of agricultural land may have to be diverted for production of crops which are used as raw materials for the production of bioethanol and this can adversely affect our food security. For example, let's say whatever land which we are currently using for cultivation of rice, wheat etc. This may be diverted towards cultivation of sugarcane cultivation of mass, etc. And this can adversely lead to decrease in the production of rice and wheat and hence affect our food security needs. The second aspect is that according to some of the experts, it can lead to promotion of unsustainable agricultural practices. For example, right now, most of the ethanol in case of India, it is produced from the sugar and sugar rated sources. So, in future, huge amount of land may come under sugarcane and if you look at sugarcane as such, sugarcane is a kind of crop which actually consumes huge amount of water. For example, according to Niti Ayo, if you have to produce 1 litre of ethanol from sugar, we would have to use approximately around 2860 litres of water on the agricultural fields. 
So you can just have a look at the ratio. The ratio is 1 is to 2860. So in future, if more amount of land come under sugarcane for the production of ethanol, this can lead to over consumption of water and it can also hinder the agricultural diversification which the government of India is right now targeting. The next aspect or the problem is a problem which has been highlighted by the Institute for Energy, Economics and Financial Analysis. According to this particular institute, if you are using the agriculture land for the production of crops for the ethanol, this can actually lead to inefficient utilization of land. Let's understand how. Please have a look at this particular figure here. So this particular figure shows as to what would happen if we are using one hectare of agriculture land either for the production of solar energy or say production of crops which in turn may be used for production of bioethanol. Take for example sugarcane. Now let's say from one hectare of agriculture land we are producing sugarcane and from this sugarcane we are in turn manufacturing bioethanol. Now the bioethanol so manufactured here can ensure that a particular car runs for a maximum distance of only around 80,000 km. On the other hand, let's say on this one hectare of agriculture land, I install a solar power project and this solar power project in turn generates electricity. This electricity can in turn be used to power electric vehicles, right? Now the electricity which is generated from this one hectare of agricultural land can in turn be used to power a electric vehicle for almost around 28 lakh kilometer. And last and most importantly, see right now when it comes to petrol, petrol is outside the ambit of GST and uh, government as such is imposing excise duty on petrol which is much higher at around rupees 27 per litre. But when it comes to ethanol as such, on ethanol the government is imposing GST which is much lower. Now what would happen is, as we start blending more of ethanol with petrol, less amount of petrol would be used and as less amount of petrol would be used, the overall tax which the government would collect through the excise duty on petrol, this will get reduced. According to Niti Ayo, the E20 program can potentially lead to a loss of almost around 11,000 crores per annum to the government of India. So this is as far as challenges to the economy is concerned. Now coming to the challenges faced by the producers of ethanol, see right now according to Niti Ayo, the total current production of bioethanol that is the total capacity to produce bioethanol is around 700 crore liters. But if you have to ensure E20 by the end of 2025, then we have to have a ethanol production of at least around 1016 crore liters. So right now there is huge demand supply mismatch when it comes to bioethanol. So going forward we need to significantly ramp up the production of bioethanol. The other problems include weather related issues such as floods, drought etc which can adversely affect the crops and hence the availability of raw materials for the distilleries. Next coming to the challenges faced by the oil marketing companies. See like I said earlier the government of India has amended the Industries Development and Regulation Act 1951 for the smooth interstate movement of the ethanol. But as of now, some of the state governments have yet to implement this particular amendment. So in a way, there are certain restrictions with respect to the interstate movement of ethanol, which in turn is adversely affecting the oil marketing companies. Lastly, coming to the challenges faced by the consumers, first and foremost, if you look at the most of the vehicles which are sold in India, they can function optimally up to E10, that is 10% ethanol blending. But in future, when we start selling petrol up to 20% ethanol blending, that is E20, according to some of the experts, there could be decrease in the fuel efficiency of the vehicles by almost around 6 to 7%. So going forward, what we need to do is we need to manufacture more of flex fuel vehicles. So if you look at these flex fuel vehicles, their internal combustion engines are designed in such a manner that they can function on either 100% petrol or even 100% bioethanol. 
or a combination of both petrol as well as bioethanol. So we need to manufacture such kind of flex fuel vehicles in order to ensure that there is no drastic decrease in the fuel efficiency. And lastly, according to some of the experts, once we start manufacturing the E20 ethanol, there could be an increase in the prices of vehicles. So this can adversely affect the consumers. So in order to address these problems and challenges, the Niti Aayog has highlighted some strategies. What are these strategies? First and foremost, we need to encourage the cultivation of less water intensive crops such as maize for the ethanol production. Secondly, we need to encourage the production of ethanol, particularly from the non-food crops such as the agriculture residue, municipal waste and so on in order to promote waste to wealth economy. Nextly, we need to provide for a single window clearance for the speedy clearances of new and expansion projects for ethanol. Nextly, tax incentives may be provided for the E20 blended vehicles in order to encourage people to buy such kind of flex fuel vehicles in future. And last and most importantly, the pricing of ethanol blended fuel that is E20, it should be lower than the normal petrol in order to compensate for the reduction in fuel efficiency. So these are some of the strategies as recommended by Niti Aayog. Please have a look at these prelims question for practice and let me know the answer in the comment section given below. In case if you want to know the right answer to these questions, please go to the end of the video. The next article appears on page number 9. The article is titled as A Probe into the Nehruvian Pledge. See when India became independent in the year 1947, we took a pledge to promote inclusive growth and development. We took a pledge to ensure that the fruits of development reach the bottom strata of the Indian society. In this regard, this particular article here analyzes India's performance with respect to promotion of inclusive growth and development. So as far as the UPSC mains examination is concerned, one should be aware about various aspects of inclusive growth, that is its meaning, difference between inclusive growth and welfare approach, the elements of inclusive growth and its challenges. Now all of these aspects related to inclusive growth I have already covered in the DNS dated 9th of December 2021. The link to this particular video has been provided in the description box below. Apart from this, this article also discusses about India's performance with respect to global gender gap index. So normally in the prelims examination, questions are repeatedly asked with respect to important global indices. Hence, keeping in mind the requirement of the UPSC prelims examination, let us look into important aspects of the global gender gap index. See the global gender gap index it is a report which is published by the World Economic Forum. As the name suggests, this particular report seeks to capture the gender gaps, that is the gaps between the male and females with respect to various indicators of development. So this report as such captures the disparities between male and female with respect to economic participation and opportunity, educational attainment, health and survival and political empowerment. Now, for example, with respect to political empowerment, this report looks into the percentage of women in the parliament, the percentage of women in the ministerial positions and whether a particular country has a female head of state or not. With respect to health and survival, it looks at the sex ratio at birth and disparities in the life expectancy between males and females. With respect to educational attainment, it looks at the female literacy rate, the female enrollment in primary education, secondary education and tertiary education. With respect to economic participation and opportunity, it looks at the female labor force participation rate, that is what percentage of the female in the working age group are either working or looking out for work. It looks at wage equality between males and females. It looks into the number of legislators, senior officials and managers who are females and the number of professional and technical female workers. Now when you look at this particular framework, right, 
this particular framework can be kept in mind while writing an essay related to gender empowerment. Let's say you would want to analyze the extent of gender empowerment in India. So while writing such an essay, you could keep in mind broadly four distinct dimensions that is economic participation, educational attainment, health and political empowerment. And within each of these macro dimensions, you could have the sub dimensions. So if you're able to write such an essay by incorporating such macro and micro dimensions, your essay would look much more structured. Now, when you look at India's performance with respect to the Global Gender Gap Index, which is the latest report published by the World Economic Forum, India has approximately around 662 million women. And if you look at this particular indicator of political empowerment, which takes into account the percentage of women in parliament, percentage of women in ministerial positions, female head of state and so on. Here, among all of these four indices, India ranks highest when it comes to the political empowerment. However, India's rank is much lower as compared to some of the smaller countries such as Bangladesh. For example, with respect to political empowerment alone, Bangladesh is placed at 9th rank, but India is placed at 48th rank. Similarly, if you look at India's performance with respect to economic participation and opportunity, India has been ranked at 143rd place out of 146 countries. Only three countries fare much poor in comparison to India on this particular parameter. And these three countries include Iran, Pakistan and Afghanistan. With respect to educational empowerment or attainment, India has been ranked at 107th place. And last and most importantly, when you look at the health and survival parameter, India is ranked last on this particular parameter among 146 countries. So these are some important things which you must understand as far as the global gender gap index is concerned. Now this topic has appeared at page number one and is in relation to the African cheetahs which were to be translocated from Africa to India. This is the very context of this news article and this theme is one of the most important themes as far as last two to three years are concerned and these cheetahs were to be translocated to India by 15th August. And this is the very context of this news article. This article says that despite the deadline of 15th August, still the cheetahs are not translocated from Africa to India. And hence they have missed an unofficial deadline of 15th August. However, the sources say that these wild cats are likely to arrive here within this very year. As far as the syllabus is concerned, this topic falls under General Studies Paper 3 section because it has a subsection of environment and this has a micro section of conservation. And because the basic idea of translocating cheetahs from Africa to India is their conservation. As we all know that cheetahs are one of the most endangered species. They have been extinct from most of the parts of the world and now they are found only in few patches globally. And that is why in order to increase their survival possibility, we are focusing that they need to be translocated in different areas. If you go to the historical expanse of the cheetah population in India, this map shows it. Now as you can see here that cheetah population was present across India and present day Pakistan and it was a widespread population. And it covered almost all the parts, the western part of India, the northern part, the central part, as well as the south of India. And if you closely look at the period, the years in which this data is collected, it is just during the colonial period, that is the British period. So it is not like that, that we are talking about many centuries ago. No, we are just talking about the period around 100 or 200 years ago. So this means that cheetah population was spread across India and Pakistan at that point of time. Similarly, if you go by the historical aerial expanse of cheetah population across the globe, you can see that this particular color shows the expanse of cheetah as a historical range. And these black patches showcase the present distribution of cheetah population. Now, as far as this Asian continent is concerned, there is just one black patch, which means that in Asia, the cheetah population has got extinct except 
the parts of central Iran. That is why as far as the IUCN red list is concerned, that is the global status of the threatened degree of cheetah, the population lies in the vulnerable category group. That means the cheetahs according to IUCN red list are vulnerable. And this population lies in the appendix 1 of the sites. But as far as the India is concerned, the cheetah population has got extinct. So cheetahs have vanished from approximately 90% of their historical range in Africa and are extinct in Asia except for a single isolated population of perhaps 50 individuals in central Iran. This is very important. Similarly, 79% of all the cheetah populations contain 100 or fewer individuals. Now this is talking about the one population group within a specific area. For example, if we talk about the population of cheetahs in this part, that is the central Iran part, the data suggests that there are just around 40 number of cheetahs present in this entire area. That means in entire Asia, we have just 40 cheetahs and 10 to 12 number of adult cheetahs only in this particular group. So that is why it is said that around 80% of all the cheetah population present in different patches in all those groups we have fewer than 100 individuals. So till now we have discussed the factual information now we will come to the analytical part. First of all it is important that you should know that cheetahs thrive in diverse habitats ranging from the scrub forests to the savanna and dry grasslands to the arid as well as semi-arid open habitats. Now one thing is very important as we know that cheetahs are one of the fastest moving animals. This means that the natural habitat where cheetahs can live should not be a dense forest. Rather it should have ample amount of open spaces which can provide the cheetahs to have opportunity to run fast. Clear. That is why cheetahs are mainly found in the scrub forests. These are not dense forests. The grasslands which provide a huge vast aerial expense where cheetahs can run to their maximum speed. But the point is that despite knowing the fact that cheetahs can thrive in the diverse habitats and also the fact that cheetahs were actually present in diverse locations across the Indian mainland, why the cheetahs got extinct? So these are the four primary reasons behind the extinction of cheetahs. The first is that what happened was that way back cheetahs were used to hunt black buck and that is why many kings and rajas took the cheetahs from the wild to their palaces in order to use those cheetahs to hunt black buck. So in this sense the cheetahs lost their natural habitat. The second important thing was the British policies of deforestation, construction of railways, etc. Moreover, the British also announced bounty for killing the cheetahs. So, in order to have these rewards and awards from the British government, many people were involved into killing and illegal hunting of these cheetahs. The third important thing was that because of these two things, there was a reduced genetic diversity and very high infant mortality rate among the cheetah population. Further, it is also witnessed that the hobbies and interests of the rajas and kings, especially in the medieval era was such that they were not the wildlife conservationists. They used to hunt the animals. For example, it is believed that the king Akbar had around thousands of cheetahs in his palace which was used by him for his personal interests. So the thing is that at that point of time we were not aware about the wildlife conservation principles and importance. So that is why we were involved in hunting and illegal poaching of cheetah population which ultimately led to the extinction of this species across Asia. And that is why in order to reintroduce cheetahs in India, the government of India is planning for a reintroduction project whereby the African cheetahs will be brought from Africa and will be translocated in India. But despite this, several environmentalists have said that there are multiple issues which are involved in this reintroduction project and that is why now we will look at what are those issues involved. The first and the foremost issue is that the cheetah reintroduction project is coming in 
direct clash with the lion conservation project so the natural habitat is same for cheetah as well as lion for example if we talk about the kuno national park where it is believed that cheetahs will be reintroduced now in the same national park we are also planning to introduce the lions from gir forest that is in gujarat because we have only one particular area of asiatic lions that is gir national park so we think that restricting the animal species into one particular area can be very dangerous for example for example let's say that if there is a huge deforestation or there might be a spread of deadly disease or there can be a forest fire in this gir national park so we must have some other areas also so that our asiatic lions are not dead in one go that is why we are translocating the asiatic lions from the gir to the kuno national park so now the experts question this that kuno national park will be having lions will also be having cheetahs and these are the tertiary predators having almost same prey species so in a way they will compete among themselves they will kill themselves so that is why this goes against the principle of biodiversity conservation the second important thing is that cheetahs need extensive areas as we have already discussed that because they run very fast so that is why they require extensive areas and the natural habitats of african cheetahs are slightly different from the asian cheetahs the habitats which india has is different in some degree as compared to the african habitat so experts again say that it might not be sustainable up to a very long period the third important thing is that india has huge number of animal wildlife conflict cases on daily basis even if we introduce cheetahs into our national parks what is the guarantee that there will not be human wildlife conflict what is the guarantee that there might not be illegal trafficking and poaching in those areas because we know the present situation is that we are not able to run away completely with this illegal poaching next important thing is the natural ecosystem as we have discussed that the natural ecosystems of africa versus asia is entirely different similarly namibia versus india is entirely different so the point is that even if you reintroduce one particular species of population from one area to other area is it guaranteed that all the natural climatic environmental conditions of these two areas are same experts say that no it cannot be exactly same further the experts have also questioned the basic objective of this reintroduction project several experts have said that this reintroduction program is not aimed at conserving the biodiversity rather they are aimed at boosting the tourism potential because if we have lions if we have cheetahs we can invest in lion safaris cheetah safaris and all that thing so in the name of adventure tourism what we are doing is that we are playing with the natural ecosystems so these are the issues which are involved which have been raised by multiple experts for the cheetah reintroduction action plan this topic has appeared at page number 14 the latest context of this topic was that recently early childhood development conclave took place in mumbai whereby union minister of state for health mr bharti pravin pawar launched the palan 1000 national campaign so this palan 1000 national campaign becomes very important from the prelims perspective if you go by the previous year question paper analysis every year there are a lot of questions which are specifically asked from the recently launched government schemes or programs in this very line today we are going to discuss palan 1000 national campaign now this palan 1000 national campaign is very important because it is one of its type program which specifically focuses on the cognitive developments of the children in the first 2 years of their life that is why it is said that it is the journey of the first 1000 days it is a comprehensive program which talks about the early years coaching for the parents families as well as the other caregivers with the services which are specifically designed to meet the family basic needs this palan 1000 national campaign is aligned with the rashtriya bal swasthya karyakram and in this very line an important app that is palan 1000 parenting app will also be launched 
and this app will specifically provide the advices to the parents or the other caregivers and it will help them to have a practical guide the steps which they can take in their everyday routine regarding the child care activities as well as if they have certain doubts they can also have their answers on this parenting app there are six principles in this national campaign for all the caregivers and parents first that they should maximize the love second they should talk with their children because in the first 5 years of the life maximum cognitive development takes place it is at this particular period whereby the reflexes get stronger and the attention span is very high next principle is that they should explore through the movement and playing activities with the children fourth is reading and discussing the various stories next is the mother's engagement with the child while breastfeeding and last and the most important is managing the stress and staying calm now these are the six principles which can provide us a beneficial results as far as the cognitive development of a child in the first 2 years of his life is concerned this campaign is known as palan 1000 national campaign this topic is specifically a factual topic and is only relevant from the prelims perspective however this can be used as an example by you in the answers in your mains also recently a train named super vastuki has made headlines in newspapers why this train is important because it is one of the longest as well as heaviest freight train which india has run on its track its length is almost 3.5 kilometers and it had 295 loaded wagons it was basically started to carry over 27000 tons of coal and it was started as a part of azadi ka amrit mahotsav celebrations now just few years back there was a train named as vasugi and that vasugi train was the longest by that date but now super vasugi has started it ran between korba in chatisgarh and rajnand gaon in nagpur and this was run by south east central railways so the important thing is that the super vasugi is the longest and heaviest freight train of india which was launched as a part of azadi ka amrit mahotsav celebrations and it carried over 27000 tons of coal from chatisgarh to nagpur so now is the time for the question of the day the question from yesterday's dns dated 16th of august 2022 was in relation to the sagar initiative the question said that sagar initiative seen sometimes in news is related to which of the following the answer for this particular question is option d india's effort to ensure maritime security and have a sustainable growth side by side the question from today's dns is which among the following agencies publishes the global gender gap index option a world bank option b un women option c world economic forum or option d imf so that's all for today all the very best and study hard